The Legacy of the Naga Lords. A short story. Permit me to set the stage for you with a hypothetical. You stand before a tribunal, hands manacled in materials indicative of an exhaustible research dedicated to your demise. You deserve to be here. The crime? The air you exhale poisons everyone around you. Even with evidence, professional research, and thousands of witnesses, would any court's verdict be sane? How could you be held accountable for something you have no agency over? No matter the magnitude of the crime, no matter the punishment, what would be the point? Your crime was breathing. And unless they stop you, you can't. Mind you, this ethical dilemma was not considered during the Litus trial so many years ago. Because there was no research, nor bioanthropologists to consider it. In a planet of cultural evolution tied to our instincts, our baser animalistic roots, you would think we would have factored in such a thing long ago. But we did not. Because surely we are evolved beyond the primordial of what drove us past limbic and thalamic. But would that merely be an excuse? Who would dare justify the despotic rule of the Naga Lords? For hundreds of years, the early dregs of civilization were parallel to our own. However, our rulers and leaders were quite different. History was peppered, or dare I say, contaminated by the ambition of the Naga Lords. Huge serpents with dreams of grandeur. To categorize them as delusions would be a disservice to the power, competence, and influence at their beck and call. Some considered them gods others demons, yet none could deny the charisma and command they held, weaving swaths of culture like a despotic conductor imposing a symphony of their will across history. A single Naga Lord could command a country. The Naga Lords were powerful because of their hold on the mind. With a lock of their gaze, they could command proud generals to betray their countries, turn true believers into heretics, even alter the very concept of reality to the resolute. Their rule was never in question. Ancient civilizations were defined by three massive empires. The Ouroboros Emirates, the Serpentis Triumvirate, and the Shang of the Pit. The Ouroboros Emirates ruled the deserts, self-proclaimed gods emblazoned on jewelry and pictographic murals, constructing sprawling statues and myths around themselves to make them appear larger than life, so much so that the sands struggle to reclaim them to this very day. The Serpentis Triumvirate crafted one of the earliest senates, taking the time to hear the cries of their charge and enact strict laws that fashioned modern justice, dominating the European continent and spreading their influence across the planet with ships and missionaries decrying their rightful authority. Finally, there was the Shung of the Pit, brutal imperials who claimed the jungles and temperate regions of the East as their private hunting grounds, raising and compelling their thralls in the art of their hunt so they can amuse themselves with the most dangerous game. They found pride in such capable prey, for weak blood would hemorrhage quite freely to keep their dynasty strong. Their nations were sprawling metropolises, citadels of grand design where obelisks disseminated a great hypnotic light reflected from the central palace, a constant reminder that the sun was but a reflection of their authority. The Ouroboros Emirates had massive ziggurats of complex mazes, both for security and for the glory of hunting for sport and amusement. 
Their structures were beset in a way that resembled a tightly bound coil from the sky, as if there were two cities betwixt the patterns. For the Serpentis, their vanity was in ornate embossing and decorative works of immaculate beauty. Serpentis molding was some of the grandest in the world. Merely following its intricate mosaics and stained glass would be enough to put a weak-wheeled thrall into his stupor. Much of the history of the Shung of the Pit was recorded on murals with iridescent ink, designed for the lords to admire and pray to remain asleep, virtually incapable of comprehending their own history beyond their obedience. Some found the wherewithal to learn and orally recount what they had to offer. Such was the first chink in their immaculate armor. In their society, you were either a Naga Lord or you were prey. Regardless of how great, how capable, how worthy they were, thralls were at their service. Cultural feats, technological discoveries, even battles were attributed not to the thralls that performed them, but the Naga Lords that commanded them. That's not to say the Naga Lords were incurious or devoid of ambition. Many solitary Nagas traveled the world, discovered great sciences and technology. Many cultures described a lone Naga entering their land and completely redirecting their society in service to their new sovereign's whims. The Naga Lords did not suffer from petty envy or political infighting. Even amidst the three empires, they remained cordial, respecting each other's rightful rule, staying out of each other's way, and forming representative courts in regards to the crimes of the singular Naga or the Thrall. Nagas had no business in showing weakness before those they ruled over. But the Thralls were not as complacent as the Lord's scribes would have us believe. For years, each of the empires had their splinters of dissidents, rising and falling with the tide, obliterated and made example of. It wasn't until the advent of globalized communication that the empires faced a sudden and simultaneous overthrow of their way of life. No one is certain why the Nagas, for all their enigmatic competence, had their legacy slip through their fingers. Perhaps it was their arrogance that made them overconfident. Maybe evolution deemed chaos preferable to this stagnant order. Or, perhaps, one Naga Lord grew a conscience. The rebellion was brutal, bloody, and sustained for a full generation, requiring the collective prey to think in longer terms than the Naga Lords, beyond themselves, beyond the miserable present for the hope of a future few would have to endure under their cold, hypnotic gaze. Bodies were crushed, minds shattered, but none denied it was worth it. Society adapted to the many smaller examples of collective rule around the world, the cost was high, but what freedom isn't? After the Naga Lords fell, the vacuum that came was a tumultuous decade. Had it not been for the array of deprogrammers, thought engineers, and hypnotherapists, much of the skills and technologies crafted under Naga rule would have been lost to time. Many had to contend with the memories associated with thrall life. How much of it was theirs? There were long debates of whether it was right to preserve those memories, or to be better left forgotten. Many had difficulty contending with agency over mental sanctuary. Would you have abandoned the greater half of your life if it meant being insulated from the horrors and degradation of your thraldom? Ultimately, it was the Thymists that paved the way for modern society. A select group that made the unenviable sacrifice to remember everything for the greater good. Without Naga rule, society had noticeable gaps in infrastructure almost by design, it seemed. 
There was no trust for established rule, no repository for knowledge in languages anyone understood. Literacy and education was challenging when the thrall was expected to simply react and follow. The thymists who were gifted with an education or rare talent were tapped to the limits of sanity. Self was celebrated, and by the time the first generation came forth without thraldom, schools were the first to be erected. Theological debates, scientific curiosity, physical and creative pursuits no longer orbited these perceived gods. Some believe the thymists would become the new rulers of society. And for a brief time, they were. For they had one last harm to inflict on the Naga Lords. Judgment. The Naga Lords were set upon tribunals. But like all who gained power quite suddenly, it was not fueled by justice, but revenge. How could a fair trial be cast if the whole of society was the victim? It went beyond merely the perceived malice of Naga kind. There was a question of whether or not a Naga could even exist outside of their kingdom. It was a debate wreathed in cruelty, racism, and pain. There was little need for witnesses. The jury already knew. The tribunal gave the Nagas the chance to speak for themselves. Some feigned guilt. Others tried to bargain for compromise. But it was Osmi Yayakar, the High Patriarch of the Ouroboros Emirates, whose words echo to this very day. I stand before you deposed, but unhumbled. You expect justification for the deeds of my kind, when you merely look outside to the monolith serving as a signature of ownership to this earth for an answer. You see a court. I see bacterium struggling to grasp literature. My words today are not for the prey whose cilia prickles at my coil, but your children who are now burdened with your folly. You now carry the weight of power to etch your very names into the rock and metal of the earth. We carried this duty for you for millennia. Now you carry the mantle. You will not find a paradise your parents promised you, but a world not unlike the one being abandoned. So, when you find your misery without answer, ask your leaders to look in a mirror, for they will only see my reflection. In the eyes of the prey, their cries for extinction are without question. Had you been there, with the better half of your life stolen or tormented, perhaps you would have demanded the same. In the end, the Thymists disagreed. They posited those unburdened with the memory of thraldom would be quick to enact the cruelties of their predators out of spite. There would be no fewer monsters after that. The Thymists, in their wisdom, would not use the tools of their oppressors. Instead, they considered the impossible. Rehabilitation. Time imprisoned, but spent learning humility, empathy, and, most of all, temperance. It would take years, and the children of the Lords would have to spend their upbringing learning the virtues of modern society, away from the tyrannical dynasties of their ancestors. Tragically, the Thymists' verdict was not enacted as kindly as they wished. Any opportunity to make a Naga's life harder was embroiled in the system, but that was a paltry obstacle compared to the conundrum that was eventually discovered. As part of their rehabilitation, a research think tank was founded to better understand the nature of the Nagas, 
decoupled from dogma and hypnotically enforced fervor. Many Naga lords, having been moved by the mercy of their once servants, volunteered to collaborate in such studies. What they discovered complicated the fate of the lords. Their right to rule, their arrogance, their inherent ambition. It was not a cultural construct, but a biological imperative. Nagas needed control, baked into their very blood as instinctual and vital as sex or a pulse. Years of rehabilitation would not remove this urge, this evolutionary fiefdom. So what would become of them? How do you integrate a creature whose nature is to upend your way of life? Once again, the Thymests took time to consider, and their verdict was not without flaw. The children of the Lords would live their lives under scrutiny. A guardian assigned with careful training and an eye to help the Nagas get their urge for command out of their system. None were allowed positions of power or command, and they would be well documented and watched over. The kin would be discouraged to the burdens of life so as not to tempt them for a greater lot. But they would not rule ever again. Nagas live long lives. Many of the lords still remember their rule quite fondly. Those who have tried to rehabilitate regulate their urges with volunteer thralls or intense medications, while their kin are not exposed to such experiences. Scientists continue to experiment with CRISPR therapy, hypnotic assistance, and heavily regulated indulgence. But ultimately, the closest thing to a solution was disciplined abstinence. Some preferred death if it was an option. Alas, the wisdom of the Thymests was short-lived. The thralls age and fade. The long wound of the Naga Lord's rule would be lost to time. They knew this was inevitable and tried to share their teachings to those willing to learn. Some do their best to live as the Thymus taught, but the world is rarely run by the wise. Nagas now live between two lives, either one of regulation or incarceration. The lords of yesteryear pine for the chance to take back the world that was once theirs, and their kin struggle with both a world that fears them and the urges that justify that fear. The last of the Thymests eventually passed, respected in memory alone, their wisdom cherished as the relics of Naga rule are left to rot, and the old world is gradually forgotten. As for Osmi, his words did not waver. He remains in his cell, uninterested in rehabilitation, but also resolute in his belief. The thralls will have their world, and when they inevitably choke the land and devour each other fighting over the few scraps left, he will emerge ready to take his place in rule once again. Osmi's greatest virtue is patience. After all, what better way to instill loyalty than to show them how rightfully afraid of control they should be. If you enjoyed this, feel free to leave a comment and ask any questions. Perhaps I'll write another story. Thank you for listening.